So uh, to just to introduce both of you, um, you're both esteemed professors or doctor. You both have doctorates, Dr. Uh, David Friedman and Dr. Walter Block. Uh, Dr. Block is a professor at Loyola. Um, he has written uh, Machinery uh, Freedom. <laughs> oh, no, that's David's book. <laughs> Dr. Block, Dr. Block wrote Defending the Undefendable, uh, I think one and two, maybe three. I'm not sure. Um, and then we have David Friedman, who wrote Machinery of Freedom. He is the son of Milton Friedman, but he's a little bit different. You know, you're, uh, you'll, you'll figure out why later if you aren't already familiar with him. Um, they're both anarcho-capitalist, but they take very different approaches to economics, and they're also both economists. So this is going to be really interesting uh, to see who wins this debate, and who comes out on top. Um, so who would like to go first? Did, did, we, did, we, de did we decide that? Walter is going first. We agreed right. on that. Okay, so oh, also before I go, we should also clarify. So we're going to start off in 30-minute blocks. Uh, each are going to get 30 minutes to speak. And there's going to be a 10-minute rebuttal. And then after that, we're going to get into the Q&A. And then I believe after that, we're going to have, you know, we're going to round things up with 10 minutes apiece. And, uh, you know, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> so let's go for it. Okay, well, first, I'm, I'm sure in behalf of David, I thank Logan for putting this on. And uh, in the preliminary, we've each decided uh, that we're going to try to convert the other. Uh, uh, David is going to try to convert me to Chicagoism. I'm going to try to convert him to Austrianism. Uh, I failed with my uh, teacher, Gary Becker. He was my thesis advisor. Uh, I'm sure David will have no objection to me carrying accounting Gary Becker as a Chicagoan, even though at the time he was at Columbia, because there are many universities of Chicago, as I'm sure David again will agree. There's the University of Chicago in Los Angeles, UCLA. There's the University of Chicago in New York, namely Columbia, when Gary Becker was there. Not so much nowadays, but in those days. And um, my critique will be of Chicagoites wherever they are, not necessarily of Chicago, and I'm sure David will not object to that. Okay, so let me tell you my story with Gary Becker. I was writing my uh, PhD on rent control, and he was my thesis advisor. And um, um, my thesis was that rent control screws up housing. It creates, I don't know, um, uh, shortages and lousy housing. And I did an econometric analysis where my main independent variable was numbers of years of rent control. New York City still had it, other cities didn't. And I try to control for everything else I could think of under the sun, namely uh, wealth or uh, weather or uh, north-south dummy variable, or every, anything I could throw, any, any kitchen sink I could throw in there in order to hold everything else constant. And most of the times I did pretty well. I, I got the right signs, namely the more rent control, the lousier housing in various ways. And um, usually it was statistically significant, but every once in a while I got the wrong sign and embarrassingly, every once in a while the wrong sign was statistically significant. And I would uh, show this to Gary and uh, Gary was a nice guy. What, he, what I thought he really meant was, was um, block you moron, go out again and do it till you get it right. What he said was, uh, Walter, go out and do it again until you get it right. So what was testing what? And I was trying to convert him to Austrianism by saying, look, we know what's right about rent control. And, and this uh, econometric regression, uh, it, what's testing what is, is the opposite way around. Uh, namely, uh, the uh, theory is testing my econometrics, which uh, sometimes was OK and sometimes, sometimes was not. And yet this is the very opposite of the logical positivist view, where you're supposed to be testing theory. And um, I, I tried my best to convert him out of it and I, I didn't succeed, but um, I, I maintain that what's going on here when we test the minimum wage is, uh, or, or test free trade or test anything uh, of which we have uh, theories on. We don't have any theories about um, uh, what the elasticity of bananas is. You know, that's a purely empirical thing. And there's no, uh, the only way to find that out is to do an empirical test. But we have theories about uh, rent control, minimum wage, free trade, other things like that. And what's testing what is not the econometrics testing the theory, it's just illustrating it. And sometimes uh, as in Card and Kruger with their um, crappy stuff on minimum wage, uh, I think the, the illustration was wrong, but it's always an illustration, it's never a test. Okay, I now wanna talk about praxeology. 
And I'm going to have to share a screen here. So let me pull up a screen. I'm going to clear all the drawings. And what we've got here is um, analytic, analytic, and we have a synthetic. And we have over here a priori and a posteriori. And that gives us four boxes. And what we have now is, uh, this would be a tautology. If it's, uh, by the way, analytic and synthetic are a logical or empirical status of a sentence, whereas a priori and a posteriori is how do we get there? And we get there uh, either by thinking in, in this case or by um, uh, examining reality, looking at reality. And uh, over here, we have a tautology. Uh, all bachelors are uh, unmarried men. Uh, elephants are big uh, gray animals, things like that. Uh, these are analytic uh, uh, based on, on the uh, status and uh, they're a priori based on how we know them. They're absolutely necessarily true, but they don't tell us about the real world. They only tell us about um, uh, how we're using words. Synthetic would be praxeology. Um, uh, a a synthetic a priori would be praxeology. And I, I say that these are necessarily true and uh, also do talk about reality. This uh, area, th there's no such thing here. And this would be empirical stuff. It's raining outside. Uh, and if you're gonna find out if it's raining outside, you have to look outside and, and test it. So these are the four things. And I'm sure David will agree with me that there are tautologies. And I'm sure he'll agree with me that there are empirical statements, which we have to test. Where David and I, I think, part company is, uh, I think there is such a thing as a synthetic a priori. And I think he thinks that there's no such thing as a synthetic a priori. So again, what is a synthetic a priori statement? A synthetic a priori statement is something that is absolutely necessarily true. A predicted cannot be denied. To deny it is to commit a logical contradiction. And yet it tells us something about reality. And for David, who is a, a logical positivist, uh, along with most economists, uh, he would say, there ain't no such thing here. This, yes, this, yes, but uh, David would put a cross there if, if, uh, if I read him correctly. Okay, let me get out of this and let me talk about some examples. And, and remember, there are three things, tautologies, empirical statements, and um, uh, synthetic a priori. Now, not all Austrians agree with this. I'm sort of channeling um, uh, Mises and Rothbard here, not Hayek. Hayek did not go along with this. So let me give some cases. Whenever two people, A and B, engage in a voluntary exchange, they must both expect to profit from it, otherwise they wouldn't do it. And they have a reverse preference order for the goods and services exchange so that A values what he receives from B more highly than what he gives to him, and B must evaluate the same things the other way around. Whenever voluntary trade occurs, both parties intend to improve their economic welfare. Both parties necessarily do at least ex ante. I'm now gonna buy David's uh, uh, shirt, the University of Chicago shirt, and I'm gonna pay him 50 bucks for it. And let's say David agrees to sell me his shirt. Well, this must mean that I value um, the, that shirt more than 50 bucks. And uh, I, let's say I value it at 60 bucks, so I'm making a profit. And David values it less than 50 bucks, otherwise he's not giving it to me. Uh, so uh, let's say he values it at 35, so he's making a 25, 15 uh, profit. Now it might not be that, I'm, uh, that I really want the shirt. It might be that I'm trying to butter him up so that he'll go easy on me in his uh, contribution. And uh, that's why I want the shirt. We don't know why I want the shirt. All we know is there's something about that shirt because I'm willing to put 50 bucks on the barrel head and get that shirt from him. And I think that this is necessarily true and it tells us something about the real world. Another one is whenever exchange is not voluntary, but course one party benefits at the expense of, of the other. Law of marginal utility, it's downward sloping. Uh, the, the extra, anytime you buy an, get an extra thing, you value it less than before. Uh, David has three bottles of water. The first one he drinks, the second one he washes himself, the third one he does the lawn. I steal the one that he's gonna drink. Does he not drink anymore? No, he drinks, he, he just doesn't uh, do his lawn because that's the third best option for him. 
Another one is demand curves are downward sloping. I think this is necessarily true. And I don't go along with any of what's that Giffen good crap. Uh, that's all wrong. They're, they're all downward sloping. Uh, then uh, there's the Ricardian law of association. Um, you know, um, uh, if two producers, if A is more productive than productive uh, of two types of goods and as B, they can still engage in mutually beneficial exchange. Another one is minimum wage laws are enforced. Whenever minimum wage laws are enforced that require wages to be higher than existing market wages, involuntary unemployment will be higher than it otherwise would have been. This is untestable because we don't know what it otherwise would have been. And yet it tells us something about the world. And yet it's uh, impossible to deny. Uh, whenever the quantity of money is increased, while the demand for money is uh, to be held as cash reserve is unchanged, the purchasing power of money will fall. Another one, rent control leads to lousy housing, more shortages than otherwise, less supply than otherwise, less repair than otherwise. But we don't know what otherwise would have happened. So it's again, untestable, and yet it tells us something about the real world. Occupational licensure, restricted entry harms consumers. Milton Friedman in his book, um, Capitalism Freedom, one of my favorite uh, chapters, chapter nine, where he talks about uh, occupational licensure for doctors, brilliant uh, chapter, uh, this harms consumers. Everything bought by one person has to be sold by another. It sounds trite, but I don't think it's a tautology because I think it tells us something about the real world. Okay, so those are a bunch of economic examples of synthetic a priori statements. And again, what a synthetic a priori is, is true, necessarily true, undeniable, axiomatic, and yet it tells us something about the real world, something I think David would deny. Now for some non-economic examples of synthetic a priori statements. Pythagorean theorem. The, uh, the, what do you call it? The square of the hypotenuse equals the square of the sum of the sides of the triangle. Can't test that. Parallel lines cannot cross. Nothing, another one is nothing can be simultaneously red and green all over. Necessarily true. You don't have to test this. You can't test this. The idea of testing it is silly. And yet it tells us something about the real world. Uh, the shortest path between two points is a straight line. Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Man acts, um, what human action starts with, with Mises' book, um, uh, Human Action. Any attempt to deny it will still be an action. So you can't get around that. Only a living world can include death. Triangles have 180 degrees, assuming straight lines. If they're bowed in, then they need not have uh, uh, 180 degrees. An empirically oriented student who tries to measure the triangle is missing the point. This is a matter of logic. And the way Austrianism is, it's not a branch of empirical science like physics or chemistry. It's rather um, a branch of logic. That's what economics is for the Austrians. All synthetic a priori statements are non-testable, non-falsifiable, can't even think of a rejection, and yet they give us knowledge. Here, consider the following statement. All statements in economics must be falsifiable. This I would attribute to David or to uh, University of Chicago people. This is the logical positivist view. All statements in economics must be falsifiable. Well, what's the status of that statement? Well, is it a tautology? In which case it just tells us how words are being used. Or is it an empirical statement? In which case we have to test it. But David never tests any, uh, uh, anything of the sort. So he sort of hoist by his own petard on this. It's a self-refutational, it's a logical contradiction. Or try this one. If it can't be falsified by reality, it doesn't really apply to the real world. It tells us nothing about the real world. What's the status of that statement? Again, for David, it's either a tautology or an empirical statement, and it's neither. He's attempting to give an axiomatic uh, synthetic, a priori, I think a wrong one, but, uh, but he's, violating his own strictures when, when confronted with a statement like that. The Chicago and the mainstream, they sound scientific. We rely on empirical evidence to test theories. Austrians just have theories, but refuse to test them. So it sounds like the uh, Chicagoans are the good guys because uh, the Austrians are just a bunch of, I don't know, wimps or something because we don't want to test things. Well, we're not against econometrics. Econometrics is okay. It's just that 
you would um, uh, illustrate things. And sometimes the illustration fails, but you're not gonna test any of these theories because they are apodictically true, necessarily true. Uh, I believe that, uh, that economists make predictions to show they have a sense of humor because ceteris paribus is, ceteris is never paribus in the real world. Uh, minimum wage, and I think minimum wage will create more unemployment than otherwise would have existed. But what, what happens is Bill Gates uh, wants to disprove us and he starts hiring people uh, even though he's gonna lose money. Well, how can we uh, you know, um, preclude that sort of a thing? Or maybe there's a boom. Well, the, the econometrics will try to take into account a boom, but they can only do so imperfectly. Cart and Kruger come up with a case where, uh, uh, where the minimum wage doesn't create unemployment. And I think it ought to be laughed out of, out of court. I think those people ought to get their PhDs uh, rescinded or something. Okay, I've now done praxeology. Now what I'm gonna do is a whole bunch of other things where Austrians and um, uh, Chicagoites uh, disagree with each other. First of all, indifference. Indifference is a perfectly good word. Um, uh, I went to the store the other day, I wanted a can of Coca-Cola and there were 300 of them. And before I picked, I was indifferent between, I didn't care which can of Coke, they're all uh, the same, homogeneous. But in the action, I picked one of them. Namely, I have no way of demonstrating or illustrating indifference because all human action is setting aside and preferring things. You just can't uh, exemplify indifference. It, uh, it, Indifference is a technical economic word. It's sort of like work. In physics, it me and David is a physicist, a renowned physicist. He'll correct me if I'm wrong on this. But work means mass times distance. But if you're holding two uh, uh, dumbbells, 20-pound uh, dumbbells to the side, and you're not uh, moving, well, then you're not doing any work. And yet, you're going to be sweating because you're doing a lot of work. So uh, in physics, you have a technical language, and then you have an ordinary language. And it's the same thing here. Indifference is a perfectly good word, but as a matter of technical economics, you cannot exemplify it, you cannot demonstrate it. Therefore, you know, all those indifference curves that they're always drawing is problematic. Another one is rationality. If A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, then A is bigger than C, fine, no problem. But if you prefer A to B and then you prefer B to C and then you prefer, do you necessarily prefer A to C? No, you could have changed your mind because you're making these preferences at three different times. And uh, Austrians would, would find difficulty with that. Uh, Chicagoans would not. Ordinal and cardinal utility. Yes, uh, I think we both agree that there is such a thing as ordinal utility. Where David and I would diverge, I think, would be on cardinal utility. He thinks there is also such a thing as cardinal utility. I think there ain't no such thing as a util. And what cardinal utility is, is a measure of utility. Look, we have, we're not against measurement. We have height, we have weight, we have temperature, 98.6. We have speed, uh, 50 miles an hour. We're not against um, uh, um, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, but we don't think that there's any such thing as a happiness unit. Okay, another uh, divergence between Austrians and uh, mainstreamers is they believe in market failures. They see market failures all over the place. For example, let me whip up a market failure here. Let me clear the drawings here. Okay, so here's a market failure for you. Whoops, what did I do wrong? Clear all drawings. Okay, here we go. Here is um, average cost. And I gotta make the marginal cost hit the average cost at the bottom of it, otherwise I'm a rotten kid. And I should also label my axes. And here is uh, the demand curve. That's supposed to be a straight line, but what the heck. Average revenue, here is marginal revenue. And um, here is where the competitor will be. Well, where will the monopolist be? The monopolist will be where marginal revenue hits marginal cost. And what will the price be? The price will be over there. And that, that, that's the monopolist and this is the competitor. And uh, look what we have over here. We have this thing called dead weight loss. Well, dead weight loss is an exercise not only in, um, uh, in interpersonal comparisons of utility. David and I both have young grandchildren, and I'm sure he agrees with me on this. What you do with the babies, you go, peekaboo, I see you. Well, here, I see you doesn't stand for peekaboo with, with uh, David has a two-year-old grandchild. I'm sure he does this. It stands for interpersonal comparison of utility. And what we're saying is that the the demanders value the product, uh, the area under here, and it only costs here, and yet the evil monopolist is not producing it, and we have to have antitrust. 
Now, the good Chicagoans, uh, as opposed to the Keynesians, also realized, well, you know, antitrust costs money. So now we have a full employment bill for economists. We have to figure out how big is this and how much does antitrust cost? And if antitrust costs more than the deadweight loss, then don't even have the thing. But um, I think that the whole problem, that's not the problem. The, the problem is uh, that th this is problematic, that this whole thing is an exercise in interpersonal comparison utility. Now, let me give you another one. This supports um, uh, the negative income tax, negative, taking money from the rich people and giving it to the poor. Here's money. Here are utils. No, no, notice that we're in um, uh, cardinal utility. And here is diminishing margin utility of money. And here is a rich guy who's making 100,000 a year and we're gonna take 1,000 away from him. And um, uh, he's gonna lose that many utils. And here is a poor guy who only has, oh, I don't know, 6,000 a year. And um, we're gonna give, give him an extra thousand. Namely, we're gonna take money away from this guy and give it to that guy. And we'll have a, a, an accretion of utils of this amount because this guy values the dollars more than that guy. Now, I think that this is highly problematic because it's cardinal utility. And not only is it cardinal utility, but it's also interpersonal comparison utility. And yet the Chicagoans all go for this. This is the justification of um, welfare or the negative income tax. Uh, one way to refute this is the Austrian way. Another way to refute is to say, well, who says that they're all on the same uh, curve? Maybe this is the poor curve and this is the, the rich guy and when we take money away from the rich guy, we're taking um, that much utils. So therefore we're losing this a little amount of utils, but the whole thing is silly. There ain't no utils. And, and I think the Chicago school uh, stands or falls uh, with regard to, um, to utils. What else have we got? Uh, we got um, public goods, excludability and rivalrousness. Uh, they, they believe that, um, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, let me see, what am I doing here? Oh yeah, uh, they believe that there is such a thing as, as a public good uh, because if it's um, non-excludable and non-rivalrousness like the White House and defense, then you know uh, uh, it's a, a market failure. Now, uh, David is an anarcho-capitalist, so I know he's not favoring uh, government doing any of this stuff, but uh, most Chicagoans are not anarcho-capitalists and most Chicagoans of whatever uh, school, UCLA, Columbia, Chicago, wherever, uh, would favor uh, government uh, having lighthouses uh, before GPS and, and national defense. And uh, so that's another divergence uh, between Austrians and um, uh, mainstreamers and, and Chicagoans. Then there's externalities. Let me get back to the screen to do a little bit on externalities. Come on, screen share. Where are we? Here we go. Get rid of that. And what, what do we have? Here we have um, uh, the um, supply and demand of education. That's the quantity of education and that's the price of education. And this is the amount of the quantity of education uh, that will be in equilibrium. However, uh, goes the, and, and here Milton Friedman says this in his book, uh, Capitalism and Freedom. I, I don't mean to pick on him. I'm not picking on David's dad, but uh, virtually all Chicagoans would agree with this. They would say, look, this demand curve is just private benefits. But what we really should do is think of um, the sum of private plus public benefits. And, and uh, when we get that, we get a different demand curve. And, and this should be the quantity so this is the quantity of equilibrium or the actual quantity that the market will come up with. But this is the ideal uh, quantity. We should have more education and therefore we have to have a subsidy for education, whether you give a subsidy to students or the teachers or something. Well, this is just, uh, this is very, very highly problematic. I, I would uh, say, uh, I would say that um, because you see, the, the private part, the, this demand curve for the private, that's okay. That's cash on the barrel head. People are paying money and buying education, fine. But this other stuff is just um, hypothetical and they just make it up out of whole cloth. They're a bunch of, um, dare I say, socialists. And I, I don't think David uh, falls under this rubric, but many Chicagoans do. They're, they're a bunch of socialists here. The, and you know, I could easily do the opposite. I could say, look, most education, at least uh, that I'm familiar with, consists of um, um, uh, sociology and queer studies and, and 
feminist studies and black studies. And, and what it really is, is not a, uh, an external economy. This is an external economy, but an external diseconomy. And so here's the external diseconomy uh, thing. And here's supply and there's demand. Now, the usual case of uh, external diseconomy is not uh, education, it's rather pollution. And what we say, well, here is the, the private um, uh, cost, but then there's smoke and other stuff. So this would be the, um, the um, actual amount of some product, the uh, quantity actual, and this would be the quantity ideal. And therefore we have to move in this direction with pollution. And I'm saying I could do that with education. I mean, anyone can, anyone can draw stupid lines on a blackboard. So Austrians uh, diverge very much from Chicagoans there as well. Okay, now let me get to Ronald Coase. Ronald Coase is um, highly problematic. What does Ronald Coase do? He says, well, there are two states of the world. First, there's a zero transactions cost world. What is transactions cost? Well, remember I was buying the shirt from David. Well, that was just the shirt, but there are all sorts of transactions. He has to mail the shirt to me and, and he has to insure it. And there are all sorts of transactions that are involved with buying a shirt. And um, uh, Coase says that if, um, uh, in a zero transactions cost world, now look, I, I'm not going to buy that shirt from David, but I claim that that's my shirt. David stole it from me yesterday. That's my shirt. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I'm suing him for it. And uh, what, the, um, uh, what Coase says is that it doesn't matter whether the judge favors me or David. If uh, that, that shirt will end up in the same hands. Now look, suppose I value that shirt at 500 bucks. I really love that shirt. And David only values it at 20 bucks. Well, if the judge gives me the shirt, will David be able to bribe me out of it? No, he's got to pay me more than 500 and he only values it at 20. On the other hand, if the judge gives him the shirt, um, uh, I can bribe him out of it because he only values it at 20 and I'll pay him 300 and we'll both make a profit. So Coase in the zero transaction cost world says, well, um, it doesn't matter what the judge says, uh, the more valued person will get it. And uh, if I get it, the GDP will rise. And his, his shtick is to raise the GDP. One of my very first articles, one of my very first refereed articles was saying that Coase is wrong because just because I value it at 50 doesn't mean I have money. And he never said that I had to have money. Uh, I have uh, 300 to bribe David. And then I got into a big hassle with um, Harold Demsetz, who was another Chicagoan. And, uh, Harold, and, and Harold and I went back and forth um, uh, on, on whether I was right or wrong on, on the fact that Coast left this out, which was a technical, very narrow technical thing, which is a minor difficulty that I have uh, with Coast. The major difficulty I have with Coast is in the real world, what is Coast's advice to the judge? Should he give it to me or should he give it to David? And the answer is he should give it to me because he wanted to increase the GDP. Remember, I valued it at 500, David only values it at 20 bucks. And um, the, coast, uh, the coasting judge should give it to me. Well, now we have Coase as a central planner, only the judge is a central planner. How the hell does the, the judge know how much I value it at? I say I value it at 500, David could say he values it at 600. I mean, th there's no rhyme or reason. Compare to how, uh, how an ordinary judge would, uh, would rule on this. The ordinary judge would go, he would say possession is nine tenths of the law. David owns that shirt, he's wearing the shirt. Um, the burden of proof is on me. I have to prove that, um, th that I bought the shirt. I never saw the shirt before. Uh, David's got a bill of sale for the shirt or, or his son bought it for him or something. The son has a bill of sale. And the judge would just throw out my case as a frivolous lawsuit. Uh, which is a gigantic difference between the Austrians and, and the Chicagoans. I have to mention um, uh, Sherwin Rosen. Sherwin Rosen wrote another Chicagoan, uh, the University of Chicago this time, and he wrote this article, is there any hope for reconciliation between Austrians and Chicagoans? Is there anything we can learn from each other? And his answer was no. Why? Because there are more Chicagoans than Austrians. That, that's what he said. And I wrote an article and what I tried was a reductio ad absurdum. The reductio ad absurdum was, he who, um, uh, what do you call it, um, publishes last wins the debate. 
So by the way, I'm going to win this debate because I'm scheduled to go last. So according to this uh, reductio ad absurdum, I've got to win this debate because I'm going last and he who publishes last wins. Well, it's obviously silly because, you know, I might attack David and, and, and he doesn't even think that uh, my a response is worthwhile. So I publish last doesn't mean that I'm right, but what it was an attempt to uh, have a reductio ad absurdum against Drew and Rosen. Let me talk a little bit more about mathematics. Uh, for the Austrians, um, the, the dog is, is um, economics and the tail is mathematics. My claim for the Chicagoans and the mainstream is it's the opposite way around. Economics has to um, fit into um, uh, mathematics. The mathematicians love smooth curves. Why? Because you can uh, differentiate and uh, integrate uh, stuff with smooth curves, where if you have jagged curves, you can't do that. Well, uh, human action is, is um, uh, what do you call it, discrete. Uh, uh, it's not smooth. We can't engage in infinitesimally different uh, uh, amounts of things. Uh, you know, you buy a, a quart of milk, you don't buy one millionth of a, of a drop of milk or anything like that. So, um, uh, smooth curves are something that, that I think uh, comes from, from math, not from economics. We spoke about Ordinal and Carmel. Now, there are these guys, von Neumann and Morgenstern, and what they do is they concoct some sort of um, rigmarole where they take um, uh, uncertainty and they, um, uh, uh, let's suppose that um, uh, we're talking about um, ordinal utility. And I like apples better than bananas and bananas better than carrots. And we give um, uh, apples a, a three and bananas a two and, and uh, carrots a one. And now what we do is we concoct some sort of thing. Well, suppose we have a 60% chance of a carrot and a 20% chance of a, a banana and a 20% chance of a carrot. Which would you prefer, that or uh, 33, 33, and 33? And out of that, they come up with a number. And they think that this is a cardinal number. No, it's not a cardinal number. It's, it's not, a, a ordinal number is first, second, third cardinal numbers one, two, three. Well, this is a one, two, three, but it's still not a, 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 a cardinal number because for it to be a cardinal number, you have to have units and we don't have units of, of happiness. Um, I mean, here, here are some reductio ad absurdums of, of the von Neumann uh, Morgenstern. Girl A is the prettiest, girl B is the second prettiest and girl C is the third prettiest. And now we can come up with a cardinal a measurement of prettiness. Or um, my favorite composers in order are Mozart, Bach, Handel, uh, Vivaldi, and, and Beethoven. And now I can concoct um, musical, um, uh, I don't know, uh, cardinality in music, uh, which That's is 30 crazy. minutes. Uh, my time is up. Well, uh, you just one finished. last one yeah. for 30 yeah. seconds. Um, um, my favorite three comedians are Dave Chappelle, Mr. Bean, and John Cleese of Faulty Towers. And now we can have uh, funniness units. The whole thing is crazy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. My turn, I think. Uh, yes, sir. Why am I see, still seeing Walter in my screen and not seeing me in my screen? I think that's a Zoom setting. The audience can see you. Okay, all right. yeah. Uh, all right. David, I see, all, I, I see all three people. Shouldn't, uh, uh, Logan, shouldn't David see all three of us like I see? I see all three as small pictures at the top and I see your face with that nice background as the main screen. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to be of help and don't start yeah. David's time until I shut up. Right. <laughs> so Logan, can you change whatever it is such that people will be seeing my face in the center of this rather than Walter's? Very good, Walter is hiding himself. I can't even hear Logan. Whoever is speaking automatically gets full screen on my on my end. Y'all just have different um, viewing settings. Or like on I've got it viewed to I've got it set to speaker. Yeah, that's what I have too. It's full screen speaker. The audience sees you center. So if I'm so, center. what do you mean by my speaking? What do you want me to do such that it will know that I'm speaking? If you speak, it just automatically knows you're the speaker. I'm speaking. I'm saying something at the moment, and I'm seeing your face, not Walter's. Oh, that's because you, I think you have a, a the, the audience doesn't see this. They see you. But on your end, I think uh, you there's a Zoom setting that makes it so you cannot see yourself. You just see uh, whoever was the last speaker. Can I control what? that? Uh, you can. It's in your settings. I'm not really sure how to do that because I'm in full screen right now. Um, 
we don't want to be unfair to David. I, I was able to see David and you, Logan, and I think David should be able to see me and you, Logan. Yeah, if it helps, it's it's a lot easier to um change it to where you can see everybody. If you press, uh, you could press show grid view. Uh, or right, you might press what? I can press gallery. That's the closest I can come to this. What what, what do you want me to press? Um, so you're trying to see yourself, right? So you know what you look like when you're speaking. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay. So it's kind of complicated on your end because it's a settings issue. Um, but if you press gallery, you can see yourself a little bit smaller. Um, I pressed gallery. That's what I've just done. Can you see but, yourself? Yeah, but I can see. I can see all all three of us equal size. I can do that, but uh, I'm used to seeing me the way I was seeing Walter, namely as the main window. If I can't do it. I can't do it. But uh, I, I saw the three of us one third, one third, and one third. So I think we're now huh. on a par there. You were you were looking on gallery, and I was looking on uh, speaker. I don't know what I'm. But I'll do it this way. <laughs> fine, fine. Let's <laughs> just I, for I clarification. Find it distracting if I'm only seeing myself, but uh, that's not an option here. I can actually. I'm going to move something to cover Walter over so that I don't have to watch his his face when when. Oh, I'm, I see. Yeah, I see why you. Yeah. I'll behave, right. David. <laughs> Sorry, Walter, you've just been banished. You've, uh, okay. Been okay. I'll stop. Everything. The audience can't see it anyway, so I'll stop my video for you. Okay. So can you... Right. Wait, can Logan, you, you just disappeared, Logan. Come back. Now, can, can we start? Can I start now? Yes. Start my just, for clear, just to be clear, the audience only sees whoever speaks. Okay. Yes. All right. The term Austrian appears to mean different things to different Austrian economists, as I think Walter has suggested. Uh, so I... Before doing this debate, I asked Walter if he could point me at a source for his version of Austrianism, and he suggested Rothbard's book, Man, Economy, and State. So in my talk, I want to do three things. First, I want to focus on what I see as the central difference between the Chicago School approach and the Austrian approach. Second, I want to show why the Austrian approach is wrong, and third, uh, with whatever time I have left after doing those things, I want to go through a number of the places where Rothbard's errors, in my view, illustrate the fact that the Austrian approach is wrong, where he is saying things that are not, in fact, defensible. So let me, I should start by saying that the Austrian approach and, this, and the Chicago approach have a good deal in common. Uh, the Austrian approach starts out with Mises' statement that human action is purpose beha purposive behavior. And my standard definition of economics is the approach to human, to, to action, the approach to behavior, which starts with the assumption that individuals have objectives and tend to choose the correct way of achieving them. So that's pretty much the same. And a lot of the mechanics of demand and supply curves and marginal utility and such are the same. So what's the difference? The Chicago approach is to use that theoretical structure to create plausible conjectures then to test those conjectures against the real world. And let me take the example that Walter also used of the minimum wage. It, an economist would expect that raising the minimum wage would reduce the employment opportunities of the sort of workers who get minimum wage, that is relatively unskilled workers. That is a argument, but it is not a proof. That does not show it has to be true. And I will illustrate a little bit later why it doesn't have to be true. So having formed the conjecture, you then find real world tests of it. You look for situations where a minimum wage was raised by a good deal, nothing else much was happening that would change things and where there is some subset of the population you have data on, uh, which consists largely of unskilled workers such as teen workers. And you see if that confirms the conjecture. Uh, and if it does, fine, you've got a little bit more reason to believe what you suspected was true before, but you've now improved the odds. What if it doesn't? Well, one possibility is you made a mistake in the testing, that you missed the fact that something important was happening that was increasing the demand for such labor. Uh, it's possible you made a mistake in the theory. Uh, I'll be going, giving you, in fact, an example of just that in a little bit. And it's possible that your mistaken argument depends on factual claims maybe factual claims you hadn't realized you were making, you hadn't thought of the alternatives, and those factual claims are wrong. That's, as I see it, the basic structure of what's going on. Let me give an example of a different advantage to trying to test your theories. My first published journal article 
was an economic theory of the size and shape of nations. It was an extempt, attempt to explain the general pattern of the map of Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire to the present, my ambitious paper. I submitted it to the Journal of Political Economy and George Stigler, who was the editor, rejected it. And he rejected it on the grounds that to be publishable in his journal, an article had to have not only a theory, but some evidence. And he had some suggestions, none of which I thought were workable for testing my theory, but I in fact thought up some ways of testing the theory and I tested it. And on the whole, it did pretty well. And one result of that was that I was a little more sure that my theory described something in the real world. But the other result was that in order to test it, I had to think much more carefully about what my theory said. As long as the theory is just words on paper, you can be pretty vague about it and not realize you're being vague. When you get to the point of what fact in the real world would the evidence for this theory, what real world predictions does it make, you then have to think through much more carefully what your theory is saying. That was my experience and I have been grateful to George Stigler ever since uh, for, that, for that lesson. What is the alternative approach, the Austrian or at least the Rothbardian approach? And the Rothbardian approach, as I think you can see in what Walter has just been saying, is that you deduce a theoretical structure from axioms and you deduce it with certainty. It's known a priori. Uh, furthermore, you then use that theoretical structure to reach conclusions about the real world. That's what people are mostly using economics for, not just as an elegant uh, theoretical structure. Why doesn't that work? It doesn't work because there are no conclusions about the real world, or at least none that I have ever thought of or had suggested to me that you can actually determine with certainty from the theoretical structure. To begin with, we do not know what people's preferences are. Rothbard, by the way, agrees with that statement. I can give you the page number if you like. We do not know, we know that people are acting to achieve their objectives, but not what the objectives are. Any action at all could be rational behavior, could be acting to achieve your objective. All you need is that the action is itself your objective. The way I put it in one of my books is why am I standing on my head on the table with a burning thousand dollar bill between my toes? Because I want to stand on my head on the table with a burning thousand dollar bill behind, between my toes. Logically possible, it does not contradict any axiom of economics, however unlikely it may seem. So let me take the case of minimum wage. Uh, my old argument on the minimum wage, on why it didn't have to be true that what we expected was true, why it didn't have to be true that raising the minimum wage reduced the demand for unskilled labor, was to imagine a world where the people who consumed the products of unskilled labor had a very strong prejudice against consuming things that were made by low paid workers. So strong that without a minimum wage, the equilibrium wage would be say $8 an hour. And they would didn't want to consume things that they thought were being made by $8 an hour workers, and therefore there was a low demand for those kinds of goods. If you add to that the assumption that the producers have no easy way of proving to the consumers what they pay, because it's a complicated market system, where by the time the consumer gets it, it's passed through three different hands and has input from multiple, multiple producers and such. It then follows that in that rather unlikely world, uh, when you impose a $10 an hour minimum wage, the cost of labor goes up, but the demand for that kind of labor goes up a whole lot more because now all of these people are willing to buy these goods because they know they're being made by what they think are properly paid workers. And therefore the demand for the unskilled labor goes up, not down. That is not something I would expect to happen, but it is logically possible. Hence, you cannot deduce the opposite on the basis of, of, of the theory. Furthermore, we not only don't know preferences, we don't know technologies. We don't know a priori, we don't know from our economic theory, what are the ways of converting uh, one good into another, uh, or for that matter, well, utility function, we don't know how, what are the ways of converting goods into happiness, into utility. So let's take what's in fact a more plausible argument against the minimum wage, and this is the one that Cart and Kruger actually make. Suppose you had an economy where most employment of unskilled workers was by monopsonies. That is by firms where one firm is the only employer of a group of workers. So if you imagine a society with uh, multiple villages, uh, 
a village has one firm that's employing unskilled work labor. Due to the economies of scale, which are a feature of the technology that you can't predict, it doesn't pay another firm to come in. There's only room for one firm in that particular market. And if you run through the perfectly standard economics, the same economics that a good Austrian as well as a good Chicago school person has to follow, it turns out that a monopsony uh, firm employing labor will choose to employ less than the optimal amount of labor. It will not employ up to the point where the last worker just costs as much as he produces uh, because by employing less labor, they can hold the wage rate down and they save more on the wages they aren't paying on the lower wage for the bulk of their employees than they lose through not hiring the last 10% of the possible labor. In that world, if you pass a minimum wage at the appropriate level, now the employers know that they can't gain by hiring fewer workers because it's not legal to pay them less. So now they hire up to the marginal revenue value product uh, equals wage level, which is the standard competitive equilibrium. So it is therefore entirely log logically possible, consistent with all of our theory, given certain facts about the technology, uh, to have a world where uh, raising the minimum wage to some level actually, sorry, I just got a phone call, which I'm going to hang on, uh, actually uh, raises the demand for unskilled labor. I don't expect it to happen in our economy, but one could imagine an economy where it would happen. Hence, the question of the effect of minimum wage is not a question you can answer on theoretical grounds. The, I should say this argument, I got it from Cardin Kruger, but I'm busy. I got it from Cardin Kruger, but it turns out that George Stigler pointed that out uh, something like 40 years earlier or 50 years earlier in an article on minimum wage where he pointed out that if you had a monopsony employer, this result would, would apply. So what is the Chicago solution to this problem? The problem is that the theory is not adequate to reach any real world conclusions at all, to reach any real world conclusions with certainty. The answer is that we, do not know what preferences are, but we know quite a lot about preferences. We're human beings, we observe other human beings. We therefore have a pretty good guess that a human being will not actually want to stand on his head on a table with burning a thousand dollar bill between his toes. We have a pretty good guess that consumers don't put an enormous weight on knowing what the workers who produce the things they consume are paid. Uh, we have some information about technology, uh, we, in fact, know that in our economy, unskilled workers are not specialized. Therefore, it is unlikely there will be one employer for all of the unskilled workers in San Jose. Uh, we also know that in our economy, people are pretty mobile. So if there's a substantially higher wage for unskilled workers uh, in Oakland than in San Jose, the workers will work there. So we have good reason to expect that both of my reasons for the minimum wage having the wrong effect, having the opposite of the expected effect, don't hold, but that depends on beliefs about facts in the real world, which are not known with certainty. Uh, so therefore we use the theory to form reasonable conjectures. We then test them against real world data to get evidence as to whether those conjectures are right or wrong. And then we have the extra benefit that if it turns out the test says we're wrong, that may make us rethink the argument and we might spot a mistake. Uh, for a long time, the best example I could find of a world where minimum wage didn't have the usual effect uh, was my crazy one where the consumers all want to uh, buy things made by well-paid workers. Only when I came across Cardin Kruger did I realized there was, it actually left out a possibility that if it was not a competitive market, but a monopsonistic market, then the argument wouldn't go through. Uh, so conclusion is that the, con Conclusion of economic arguments always depend on uncertain facts, sometimes depend on reasoning that might be wrong, and therefore having reached a conclusion that you think is true, you should test it. All right, that's my summary of the basic difference. And so let me now go on to explain what is wrong with a variety of the arguments Rothbard makes. Uh, and I don't assume that these are all mistakes made by all Austrian econ economists. I don't even assume they're all mistakes made by Walter, although I think most of them are as far as I can tell. Uh, 
Uh, and I want to start with two examples where he claims to derive a general principle with certainty. Uh, and the first one is declining marginal utility. And he makes the standard argument that all of us make, which is that your first gallon of water goes to the most important purpose, the next gallon to the next most important purpose, and so forth. Consequently, the additional value of five gallons instead of four is less than the additional value of four gallons instead of three. But then the obvious problem is that there are cases where that isn't true. My standard example is that the value of having three tires for my car instead of two is quite a lot less than the value of having four tires for my car instead of three. And you can think of lots and lots of other examples of that sort. Uh, and Rothbard knows that that's a problem, but he doesn't, as far as I can tell, uh, have any solution to it. Uh, he says that what's really going on is that the right unit, he doesn't give that example, but he has one involving eggs, that the right unit is four tires, but how do you know that from your theory? Your theory doesn't tell you that. So in fact, any time that you get rising, increasing rather than decreasing, you could always explain it away by saying the right unit is 17, not 16 thing of these things, but your theory doesn't tell you any of that. So in fact, if you're, what you're trying to make is a claim about the real world, the claim you can make is that you will have declining marginal utility in those cases where what you do with the earlier units does not add additional possibilities you didn't have before to do with the later units. Or if you want to be fancy, an additive utility function, which I'm not going to go into any, any details on. Uh, he makes the same kind of mistake with regard to the marginal utility of leisure. He says that you will always value the second hour of leisure less than the first hour. And that's obviously wrong because there are some ways of using leisure where uh, you want to do something. It's something that's fun to do, but it takes two hours. So if you only have one hour, uh, you do something you don't like as much. Uh, that's still consuming hours for leisure. Uh, and therefore you get greater utility having two hours instead of one than having one hour instead of none. So those are both cases where he, he claims and goes on to use in his arguments that he knows with certainty declining margin utility for both uh, consumption and, uh, and leisure, and neither of those is true. Let me take another case, one which struck me as an unusually careless argument, and that's positive time preference. The question is, would people rather have an ice cream cone today or an ice cream cone tomorrow, tomorrow or the next day, and so forth? And the usual pattern we see is that people generally prefer to have their pleasures, their utility earlier. The question is, can you prove it? And here is what Rothbard writes on page 15 of Man, Economy, and State. A fundamental and constant truth about human action is that man prefers his end to be achieved in the shortest possible time. Given the specific satisfaction, the sooner it arrives, the better. This results from the fact that time is always scarce and a, mean to be, and a means to be economized. Well, think about that for a minute waiting to have my ice cream cone does not use up a single minute of the time I can use for either labor or leisure, all right? His point about time, that, that time is scarce and a means to be economized means that I don't want to waste time doing things. It has nothing at all to do with whether I want to get a particular consumption pleasure now or in the future. So he's simply confusing two different senses of using time one of them using time to actually do things, which consumes it. And one of them is spending time waiting for something. And while you're waiting, you can be doing your labor or doing your leisure or whatever you please. So neither of those funds. Let me now go on to the particular weird view of uh, Rothbard's that struck me a long time ago. And that's his op opposition to fractional reserve banking. Uh, and I'm talking now about private fractional reserve banking, which is what existed in Scotland when Adam Smith was writing. Uh, fractional reserve banking, uh, the bank has banknotes, uh, currency, which say something like one ounce of silver payable on demand. And what makes it fractional reserve is that the bank has, say, 10,000 such notes in circulation, but only 5,000 ounces of silver in its vault. And Rothbard argues that that's fraud. And the reason he thinks it's fraud is that he thinks that that banknote is a warehouse receipt, a claim against an ounce of silver. But of course it isn't. It's a claim to be paid an ounce of silver. In order to 
honestly agree to pay somebody something, you don't have to have it at the moment. You only have to be able to have it when he comes in. Well, what happens? The bank, of course, in addition to its ounces of silver, also has other assets. In the case of the Scottish banks, they were unlimited liability partnerships. Generally, one of the partners was a wealthy man, so they had additional assets. So if everybody wants their silver, the first, I don't remember how many I said, the first 500 come in, the bank gives them their ounces. The bank then sells some of its assets to buy another 500 ounces and pay those to the second uh, 500 to come in. So there is nothing fraudulent about the fact that the bank has a promise to pay, which it expects to be able to fulfill, even though it does not have as many ounces sitting in its vault uh, as it has uh, notes, notes circulating. And if Rothbard really believes that it's fraud to agree to give somebody something you don't have, uh, I hope he never took an advance on any book he wrote. Because when you take a book, an advance on a book you wrote, you are being paid for agreeing to deliver something which you do not yet have. Now, it turns out, oddly enough, that Rothbard's mistake with, uh, with, with fractional reserve banking is closely related to a mistake or a problem in Rothbard's argument that Walter has pointed out. Walter has this nice article which points out that according to both Rothbard and Mises, it does not matter how much money you have, how much money exists. Because if you have half as many gold coins, they'll be worth twice as much. Consequently, the quantity of money in terms of purchasing power is the same independent of how many gold coins you have. And as, as, as Walter points out, uh, that's a problem for, for Rothbard because it looks as though the market equilibrium, which has got a some particular number of gold coins, is wasting resources on digging gold out of the ground and turning it into coins, when if only the government intervened and taxed or limited the mining of gold, gold would be worth more. You could therefore do the same monetary work with less gold, and you would have saved the resources used to mine gold. I should say, although Walter didn't know it, that argument actually was made by David Ricardo about a century, a little more than a century ago. Uh, the what Walter's explanation, I'm sure Walter does not believe in the heresy that the government can make things better. Uh, and he does at the moment, at least so far, believe in the idea that uh, uh, that fractional reserve banking is, is, a, is a wicked fraudulent activity, at least I think he does. Uh, so what his response is to that, I'll let him tell you. But my response, of course, is that fractional reserve banking is precisely the free market's response to the fact that digging up gold is costly. Because by having a fractional reserve bank, you economize on your gold. You are able to do the money work of a thousand ounces of gold with only mining 500 ounces. And if your fractional reserve gets down to 10%, you can do the money work of a thousand ounces of gold or in the Scottish case, silver with only a hundred ounces. Uh, so in fact, a fractional reserve bank is the market response to the fact that digging gold out of the ground is expensive and that uh, you want money and that you can provide the money of service, money services at a lower cost than that. Uh, digging some gold out of the ground is still worth doing because in order for the bank to provide money services, it has to be able to show the people holding its notes that the notes are good for something. That means it has to have enough gold in its vault so that when somebody comes in, they can redeem the notes. And uh, by the time someone else comes in, they can have bought some more gold. Uh, so in fact, I thought it was rather neat that Walter had pointed at a problem of, of, of Murray's uh, and a problem that would be solved if only Walter would abandon this silly idea that uh, <coughs> promising to pay something when you don't have that particular something available in sufficient supply to pay it to everybody is, is fraud. All right, I see I've got a little bit more time, so I want to go in, go on to the last chunk, which is Rothbard's discussion of monopoly. Uh, he has a number of arguments. Uh, early on, he says that a monopoly or a cartel that chooses to reduce output in order to raise the price because the demand curve is inelastic can't be hurting consumers. Because after all, if it was hurting the consumers, uh, then the consumers just get together 
uh, and buy less. I quote from page 635, if the consumers were really opposed to the cartel action and if the resulting exchanges really hurt them, they would boycott the monopolistic firm or firms. They would lower their purchasing so that the demand curve became elastic and the firm would be forced to increase its production and reduce its price again. Notice that what he's assuming there is that the fact that if all of the consumers did it, they would all be better off implies that individual consumers would do it. But each individual consumer out of the million consumers of the monopoly's product, each individual consumer knows that his reducing his demand will have essentially no effect on the monopoly. He's only one in a million. Consequently, his reducing his demand will make him worse off because he wants to buy the good and won't benefit him. So the implicit assumption that Rothbard is making, which is an extraordinary assumption to make, and he never makes it explicit, is that if there is a group of people who would all be better off if all of them did something, then it will happen, however large the group. A very odd claim for somebody who believes in methodological individualism to make. Furthermore, he's not consistent because at other parts of the chapter, he argues probably correctly that cartels will tend to be unstable because an individual member of the cartel will see that by cheating on the cartel agreement, he can make more money. But of course, if we're really true that groups always act in the group interest, then the members of the cartel would see that they are better off if only they all abide by the cartel agreement, in which case the cartel wouldn't break down. So what he is doing is making a absurd assumption that you can, that you can demonstrate that something doesn't injure people because if all of them did something, they could stop it. Uh, and uh, from that assumption, and he's only making it when he needs it in order to try to reach the conclusion that he wants. Uh, let me go on to another point he makes. He says that the standard analysis he's rejecting compares monopoly price to competitive price. But he says there's no such thing as a competitive price because the competitive price is the price that would be charged by a firm who was facing a perfectly elastic demand curve, meaning a firm that could sell as much as it wanted at the market price and nothing beyond that. Well, he says there are no such firms after all, even if there are a million wheat firmer, farmers, when one wheat farmer produces more, that will affect the price. Yeah, it will affect the price. It'll lower the price by one billionth of a cent, say. All right, well, it's not as if Rothbard is not willing when he wants to make an argument to recognize that the fact that something is almost true is usually enough to make it useful. He claims, after all, that the law of one price is a tendency. Well, if it's a tendency, that means it's not exactly true, right? And yet he wants to use the law of one price. Well, if you are one out of a million wheat farmers, the, uh, allow, the, the demand curve you are facing is close enough to perfectly elastic so that figuring out what you would do if it was perfectly elastic is a pretty good way of figuring out what you will, in fact, in fact do. Uh, and other places, uh, Rothbard makes essentially the same. The, Rothbard is perfectly willing to ignore very small things when that's convenient, but somehow the fact that perfectly elastic isn't quite perfectly elastic means there is no such concept. Right? Let me go on, however, to what is really wrong, most seriously wrong with that chapter. And that is that Rothbard goes through an entire chapter on monopoly, attacking a variety of arguments, many of which most economists would attack and never once mentioning the standard economic argument against monopoly. There is no way that somebody who has no other source of information and reads that chapter will ever know what the position is that Rothbard is rejecting. What is that standard argument? The standard argument is that if you shift uh, from the competitive price to the monopoly price, that the result will be a gain to the seller that is smaller than the loss to the, to the buyer that the buyer and seller together are on net worse off as a result of that change. Never mentioned, all right? That, that's where he's trying in a sense to undercut it by saying there's no such thing as the competitive price and maybe no such thing as a monopoly price, I'm not sure. Uh, but that's his, 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 the basic argument, he never mentions it. Now, you might say, Rothbard might say, or Walter might say for Rothbard, that's all right. After all, as Walter has been pointing out in his talk, you don't have a good way of doing interpersonal utility comparisons. Since you don't have a good way of doing interpersonal utility comparisons, it doesn't mean anything to say that changing from one price to another hurts one person more than it helps the other. 
That's a fine argument. But if you really accept that argument, then most of what Rothbard's book says is nonsense. Because Rothbard says, for example, uh, page 658, we simply conclude that the relative extent of areas within or between firms on the free market will be precisely that proportion most conducive to the well being of consumers and producers alike. What does it mean to be most conducive to the well being of consumers? Consumers are not all identical. A different arrangement, something other than the market outcome, would make some consumers better off or some producers. A steel tariff will make steel manufacturer is better off and the rest of us worse off. So if you really are will, unwilling to in any way add up co costs and benefits across different people, then any statement such as most conducive to the well-being of consumers, just nonsense, it's rhetoric. Uh, that means that in order to make any such statements, you need something like the standard economic definition of economic efficiency, which we get from Alfred Marshall ultimately, though he didn't use that term which is a way, not a very good way, but I think the best way we have of saying what represents a net improvement or a net worsening uh, in the economy and the society. It's not GNP, that's nonsense, of course, as I hope Walter knows. And uh, I do not think that Ronald Coase ever says that maximizing GNP is his objective. Maximizing human welfare is an objective and we have a way of doing comparisons and it's not a very good way, but in far as I know, the Austrians haven't offered a better one. Uh, all right, I think that covers most of what I wanted to say. I've got much more extensive critiques of, of Rothbard. I have webbed them. Uh, there are seven pages of them. Uh, I put them in the uh, chat, uh, but if I've got a few seconds at the moment, I can show you the uh, URL that they are in. Let me do a share screen for a moment and... I'll post that in the Discord. So Here if you send are. any links, I can send it to our audience directly and they can open uh, it. Did, does this work? Are, are you, am I sharing the screen? Yes, it's working. Right, that's, that's the URL. So I'll just put that up and I think that does it. And I think Walter is supposed to be rebutting at this point, if I understand it correctly. Yes, sir, your time just finished. And I can thank him for having confirmed many of the things that I am saying about Austrian economics. His turn. Can we get out of David's screen, uh, Logan? Ah, great, good. Yes, sir. Um, I don't think I'm gonna convince David of uh, Austrianism somehow. I didn't work with Gary Becker, didn't work with David, but I'll- That's not the objective, it's to convince you. Well, no, the objective is to convince each other. And so far, I don't think I'm gonna uh, convince you. I don't think you're gonna convince me either, but uh, that's a different issue. Um, look, um, on this um, illustration, uh, David um, and, and testing, David says uh, one of the benefits of testing is that you come up with new ideas. And I think that's true. You do come up with new ideas when you confront the data. But this uh, also applies to illustrating. Uh, and, and again, what's testing what? Uh, I go back to Gary Becker saying, you know, block, go, go out and do it again until you get it right. I think that uh, the court is before the horse if we think that we're really testing these apodictic necessarily truths. Now, David misstates uh, my view on minimum wage. I never said that a minimum wage will lead to more unemployment of unskilled workers. I never said that. If I said it, I made a mistake. What I should have said, what I think I said was that the minimum wage will lead to more unemployment than would otherwise have occurred. And since we never know what would otherwise have occurred, it's not testable, it's not falsifiable, and yet it tells us something about the real world. Now, David mentions um, uh, several cases where the minimum wage um, uh, can backfire, namely, um, uh, there won't be any more uh, unemployment of unskilled workers. And he's particularly brilliant, I think, a uh, little pat on the back to David, in talking about uh, uh, these consumers that have this wild-eyed demand curve that uh, they only want to buy from uh, well-paid workers and, and therefore uh, they shift their demand curve to the right. But we don't have to go into that. And, and the whole thing with monopsony, I, I think is uh, highly problematic and, and monopoly. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, you see, the problem with monopoly and monopsony is how do you define the industry? If you define the industry as, um, um, I don't know, breakfast cereals, well, then you'll get a certain concentration ratio. 
If you define the industry as um, all breakfast food, well, then you'll get a lower concentration ratio. If you define it as all food, then you'll get a much lower. And uh, the uh, plaintiffs uh, want to define it uh, in one way and the defendants want to define it the other way. Uh, I, I think that this whole Chicagoite and mainstream view on monopoly is, is highly problematic. Um, but in addition to monopsony, you see, monopsony creates the same problem as um, I, I illustrated with monopoly, interpersonal comparison utility. They're comparing what would occur under monopsony, monopsony with what would occur under perfect competition. And the way I illustrated it, what would occur under monopoly with perfect competition. And the uh, Achilles heel of that is interpersonal comparisons utility. Now, obviously, it's not going to really work for um, a minimum wage because monopsony only applies to highly skilled workers, you know, maybe computer people or uh, professional uh, football players or somebody like that. Uh, there are millions of people who hire uh, millions of firms that hire um, unskilled workers. Uh, so the monopsony thing is silly. Uh, Bill, I gave the example of Bill Gates, um, or uh, there's a boom. There are many ways that the minimum wage can be um, uh, implemented and, and uh, increase in unskilled workers. But that's not the point. It, it, you have to hold ceteris paribus. David is not holding ceteris paribus. He's changing other things. The whole point of, of economics is to... Um, uh, is to have other things equal. If you, if you only want to change one thing at a time. If you change a minimum wage and you change something else, then you never know what the, res uh, what the um, result uh, stems from. Um, uh, he, uh, look, uh, take these people who um, uh, will shift their demand curve. If you had setters purpose, they would do it whether we had a minimum wage or not. And David is just saying, well, uh, they'll shift their demand curve. Well, they would have shifted it anyway. Namely, we would have had even more unemployment uh, because they weren't buying uh, from unskilled workers in the first place. So I think David makes a rookie mistake here. Right? He's not holding Ceteris Paribus. Um, he's not holding other things equal. He's changing two or three or five things at the same time and then attributing the result to what he wants to attribute it to. Okay, enough on the minimum wage. Um, let me move on. Um, this thing about um, uh, uh, diminishing margin utility because the first bottle of water is more important than the second or the third. And then he uh, comes up with the case of tires and Murray's answer to that as well. Uh, the, the proper unit of tires is uh, four tires. And David says, well, where does he get that from? Well, Murray's a maniac. He thinks that you need four tires to, to run a car, but not necessarily. Because suppose what you really wanna do is put a rut in the road. So you have three tires and, and the fourth um, uh, thingy uh, puts a rut in the road. Well, then, uh, then uh, Murray is right. Then uh, if that's your purpose, then you don't need four tires. But for most people, four tires is a unit. And if you start saying, well, you know, you have two tires and the third tire isn't going to really do you much good, but the fourth tire is going to do you a lot of good. And therefore you have increasing margin utility. I think that's highly problematic. Uh, then uh, the increase in um, uh, increasing margin utility of leisure. Again, units, if you have to uh, do something for two hours, uh, then it's two hour units. Uh, and where do you get that from? You get it right from David because he says you have to have two hours to do the thing. So I think David is being very unfair uh, in criticizing Murray on, on this sort of a thing. Uh, time preference. Uh, the usual uh, attempted reputation is ice in summer and ice in winter. And right now we're in, um, uh, we're in the, um, uh, the, the winter and um, uh, do we really want more ice? Uh, and we're not in New Orleans, we're in Canada somewhere with this uh, ice up to our armpits. We got plenty of ice. And you might say, well, we really, this is before refrigeration, we really want ice in the summer, but the summer isn't going to be here for six months. So this refutes uh, time preference for the present. Nonsense. Ice in summer and ice in winter are different goods. How do we get that? I don't know where we get that from. Common sense. I mean, ice in winter is a different good than ice in summer. Yes, the chemical properties are the same, 
but we don't go by chemical properties. We go by uh, people using these things. And you really have no need for ice in the winter, but you have plenty of need for ice in the summer. Mises, I think, is, is brilliant on this. What he says is, look, if there's no time preference for the present, what you'll do is you'll put off acting until the future. But then you get to the future and you're still not gonna act because you have time preference for the future again. Maybe you'll never act. So he deduces uh, praxeologically that there has to be time preference for the present because people act. And we know that people act because if you try to deny that people act, that's an action. So you can't deny it, it's a synthetic a priori as I've been uh, trying to tell um, David about um, um, uh, methodology here. The next thing he gets into is um, fractional reserve banking. And this is a little hitting below the belt because David and I agreed we would only talk about economics. And uh, we, we did say that if we liked this and, and we thought it was a, a productive thing, we would have another debate on libertarianism. And I regard whether fractional reserve banking is fraudulent or not as a part of libertarianism. Fraudulent is not a, an economic issue. Fraudulent is a, a crime. And a crime is um, a libertarian. So I think David was uh, hitting a little bit below the belt to mention that. And I'm not sure if I want to respond to that. Well, I don't know. Let me see if I have time for that. Uh, I, I want to go uh, to the optimal amount of uh, the optimal amount of money. I wrote an article with my colleague Bill Barnett. Uh, I, I I disagree with David very fervently on fractional reserve banking, but I, I think it's unfair for me to respond to that because David violated our agreement. Okay, uh, I wrote an article with um, uh, Bill Barnett on the optimal amount of currency or the optimal amount of gold if gold is currency, and what we came up with is that uh, whatever the market decides. Well, uh, David is saying, no, 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 because uh, if you can do the same stuff with 500 gold ounces as 1,000 gold ounces, the extra 500 are superfluous and um, are wasteful and stuff like that. And um, uh, th that means that uh, you know, we should tax gold mining or something like this. And, and his father, Milton Friedman, uh, was always calling us gold uh, people gold bugs or uh, gold maniacs or whatever it was uh, because we favored gold because gold was, you know, uh, Milton had this uh, uh, show, Free to Choose, which is a beautiful title. But when people were free to choose, they chose gold. They didn't choose the, 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 the Fed which he favors. And why does he favor the Fed? Because we can increase, you don't want to say GDP, fine. I, I'm just as much against GDP as David is. Uh, economic welfare or GDP or whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the reason we, um, we want to have um, uh, the optimal amount of gold is, is um, because that's what people are always choosing. And, and what Milton and other uh, Chicagoites are doing is trying to impose on on the market and saying, well, you know, the market, they were free to choose gold, but they chose too much gold. So we have um, another market failure. And I forgot to include that as a market failure. And I, I, as an Austrian economist, don't believe in any market failures. Why do we have so much gold? Milton and, and um, uh, David think, well, the, the extra amount of uh, gold is superfluous. Well, why do we have fences and locks? Fences and locks are superfluous. If nobody ever stole anything, um, uh, we wouldn't need fences and locks. All right. Well, who's uh, going to steal? Uh, uh, ten minutes. Start to wrap up. Yes, sir. God, ten minutes goes by. You so you can quick. finish your final point. I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to give him equal time as well, though. Um, well, I, I I don't know what to say. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about monopoly. I did talk about monopoly. The whole thing is a crock. Uh, it depends upon how you define the industry, and they define it arbitrarily. Uh, there's also a tendency for prices to equalize and profits to equalize, and that, and that is another synthetic a priori. It gives us great knowledge of what's going on. Um, um, and, and with regard to Coase, he might not have mentioned GDP. He might have mentioned human welfare. I don't remember. Uh, I sometimes use them as uh, synonymous. But the point is that uh, Coase is a central planner. Uh, he is uh, going to give me David's shirt because I value it more. And how does uh, Coase know that? I don't think he knows any such thing. Okay, I guess my 10 minutes are up. I'm sorry I went over. It's okay. Um, so that was about 12 minutes. I'm going to give Dr. Friedman, you're going to have 12 minutes as well. Okay. 
let me start with the fractional reserve bank because I don't like being charged with cheating. Uh, I would point out that Walter, when I asked him for a source for Austrian economics, pointed me at man, economy, and state. And chapter 11 of man, economy, and state is where Rothbard attacks central banking. Uh, so I think pointing out uh, both that his argument is wrong and going on to point out the economic implications, the fact that the fractional reserve bank is a way of reducing the cost of maintaining a money system, that cost being related to the fact that it's necessary to spend resources digging up gold is entirely legitimate. Let me go on. I should also say that I'm afraid First, Walter's response to me on time preference consisted of digging up his response to an entirely unrelated argument, namely about ice in summer and ice in winter, and ignoring the argument I actually made, which was that Rothbard gives no reason to believe his conclusion is true. Rothbard simply confuses using time in the sense of working or consuming leisure with using the time in the sense of getting something later than rather than foreign. That's a logical mistake, and I'm sorry if it bothers Walter to be told that Rothbard has made logical mistakes, though I think he may have said it in other contexts himself once or twice, uh, but you don't answer that by digging up your old argument against uh, the fact that the value of the things might change. Same ice cream cone can be in the same season, still the case. With regard to minimum wage, Walter wants to claim that in my examples, it isn't caterus parvis. Mine all are caterus parvis. In my example, before and after you raise the minimum wage, people had the weird tastes that I described. Given that they had those weird tastes, ordinary economic theory predicts that raising the minimum wage will increase the employment of unskilled workers. That's the logic of the argument. Sorry about it. Similarly, in the monopsony case, uh, it's not in particularly difficult to define a monopsony in that particular case, because the monopsony in question is the firm that hires all or most of the unskilled labor in a particular labor market, where I was assuming that people were sufficiently immobile so that they wouldn't move from one labor market to another unless there was a large difference in wages. And then I'm not changing anything. I'm describing the economics in a world where the labor market has a particular pattern. Now, Cardin Kruger may want to argue that ours is closer to that than I think it is, and that would be an empirical question, but I'm not changing it. It's all caterus paribus. It's just that in that world, when you make one change, which is imposing a minimum wage, the result is that the demand for unskilled labor goes up instead of down. So again, he's unfortunately attacking uh, arguments from his imagination, not the arguments that I actually, I actually made. Uh, I think... I think Walter's view of Kosa's view is, it's a cartoon. Uh, the problem of social cost, which is the article in question, is moderately complicated. If he is actually curious about the implication, I spend two chapters in my book, Laws of Order, which he's welcome to read. In fact, I think it may even be, it is even webbed, uh, so he can read it for free, uh, in working out in a Kosian world what the implications are for the law. And it's basically implications, not about uh, judges redistributing things, but about having those general rules that are optimal given the points that, that COS is, is making. So uh, the, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Walter has confused Ronald Coase with George Stigler. Uh, the term the Coase theorem is due to Stigler, not to Coase. And the Coase theorem is a tiny piece uh, of the analysis in the in the in the, in the essay uh, problem of social cost. Uh, let me see. Oh, the cardinal utility versus ordinal utility. Uh, Rothbard, in one point in his discussion, and I don't have time to dig up the exact quote now, talks about the fact that in deciding what to do, you want to take account of the uncertainty of the outcome as well as things like how long it will take. So you're making an investment project and you want to discount both for the time until you get the return and for the chance that you won't get the return. What von Neumann showed uh, in inventing what's referred to as von Neumann utility was that one could define utility in a form in which it was uh, cardinal rather than ordinal. And by doing so, get a description of consistent behavior under uncertainty. So it is not a matter of this is one, two, and three. 
What he is showing is that you can reasonably model people's behavior under uncertainty, given some plausible assumptions about how people act uh, in a way such that you have a utility on any outcome and you then faced with a, a, a lottery with an uncertain set of outcomes, you choose that outcome, you choose that lottery, which maximizes the expected value of utility. Uh, so that is a way of doing what Rothbard is claiming you have to do, but he doesn't have any idea how, namely discounting for, for uncertainty uh, of, of, of incorporating that within the normal structure of economics. That's what he's doing. Uh, part of uh, what Walter started with uh, was his criticism of statistics. And it's true, the world is a very complicated place. And unfortunately, we very rarely can get a conclusion with certainty. We have a conjecture based on theory. That conjecture becomes more or less likely to be true as the evidence does or doesn't support it. But it's not, for anything complicated, it is very unlikely that a single regression will tell you for certainty any more than a single theory will tell you about certainty. And it's too bad that we live in a complicated, well, it's not too bad, it's, it's interesting to live in a complicated world, but it's frustrating to live in a complicated world. And a whole lot of his critique, criticism ultimately comes down to that. It's perfectly true that the simple model of monopoly in which a firm is a monopoly or isn't uh, ignores all sorts of complications of the fact that you've got partial substitutes, the fact that the size of the market isn't easily defined. For example, I would claim I'm a monopoly because nobody else produces talks or books exactly like mine. But nonetheless, it is a useful set of tools because the real world doesn't consists of some markets that are close to perfect competition some markets that are close to pure monopoly and lots of things in between. And once you have thought through the logic of the simple cases, you are better equipped to deal with the complicated cases and simply saying, well, sorry, it's complicated. So I don't want to think about it is not really a, a solution a solution to that problem. Let me take a look. I think I had some other things that I had noted that I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to say. Uh, as far as I know, my father never said that he was in favor of the Federal Reserve System. Indeed, he is extensively criticized the Federal Reserve. He's the one who argued that it was responsible for the Great Depression, among other things. I do not believe he ever said that it should be illegal to have gold as money. What he did was to take the existing system, which is a fiat money system using a sort of bizarre kind of fractional reserve banking, which is economizing on money that's costless to produce, which is sort of a weird system. And he said, given that system, what is the best way for the central bank to act? And his answer was that it should act in a way which makes the price level reasonably predictable, which it does by not trying to fine tune the economy, but just having a constant rate of expansion of the money supply that is about the same as the expansion of the money demand and therefore keeps prices constant. Now he has a fancier argument in the essay on the optimal quantity of money, which actually implies that what you want is to have falling prices, but that's a fancier thing than he would expect the Federal Reserve to be able to actually run, so he's not trying to persuade them to do that. But in general, your view of, uh, of Chicago school people, and certainly of my father's, is just, is just uh, invented. It's a, it's a straw man. Uh, all right, I think, am I out of time now? No, I guess I'm not. I still have a minute and a half. I tried to keep track of it, but I, I that must have had some other points I wanted. You to have make. like you have uh, three and a half minutes. Yes, uh, right. Uh, oh, minor point, uh, work is not uh, weight times distance, it's force times distance. Those are not the same thing. Also, I am not a famous physicist. I uh, did a few years of postdoc work uh, in physics and then switched to economics because I thought I was better at it and it was more fun. So I do have a doctorate in physics, but I'm afraid it does not make me a prominent physicist or you. I wouldn't really say I'm a physicist at all since I haven't practiced physics for something like what 50 years now, close to 50 years. Uh, the, you know, let, me, let me take the, the question of interpersonal comparisons of utility because that's an interesting issue and it's something we can't do very well. And yet all of us do it. If you are deciding which of your grandchildren to give something to, to spend some money on a gift, or which of your grandchildren to spend some time doing with, part of the what you are doing is saying, I think this kid will get more pleasure out of what I'm doing than that kid, or more pleasure out of that gift. Anytime you're deciding whether to give presents to people, part of what you're doing is trying to say, uh, how much happier do I think this present will make them? 
uh, the right way to think about this rich versus poor thing is to realize that whether you have a reason to believe that the rich person has a higher or lower marginal utility depends on the question of why he's rich. If we assume that everybody has the same utility function and the reason that the rich person is rich is that he's good at making money or inherited money or something, then our best guess due to the declining marginal utility, which Rothbard and Walter believe in, is that the utility he gets from an extra dollar is less than that of the poor person. On the other hand, if the reason the rich person is rich because he really likes money and works very hard, and the reason the poor person is poor is that he doesn't much like money and therefore doesn't work very hard, you then reverse the result. You can show that the rich person that has higher marginal utility. So if you actually think about these things, instead of just uh, wringing your hands over the difficulty of doing interpersonal comparisons, you realize we, it's something we can't do very well, unfortunately. We necessarily do it that every time that Walter or, or Rothbard is making a statement about this results in, 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 in increasing the satisfaction of consumers or of producers, he is doing an interpersonal comparison, whether he admits it or not, because it's never doing, going to be raising it for all consumers. Uh, I think that's it. I'm willing to give an extra minute to the questioners. Thank you. All right. So. Um... All right, so I'm going to start looking at um, our questions for the audience, and we'll pick some of them. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a question for Dr. Block, because uh, this is kind of specific to what we're talking about. Um, what What are your thoughts on Rothbard's proposal for restoring uh, the gold standard via gold revaluation? Well, uh, it's a very technical issue as to how to restore the gold standard. I think that's one reasonable way. Joe Salerno has done some work on that. Uh, I think the more important issue is not how to do it, that's a very narrow technical issue, but rather why we should do it. And why we should do it is uh, uh, as a, an insurance policy against the government. Right now we've got inflation thanks to Joe Biden and his uh, Fed. And um, uh, we've had the bouts of inflation before. Uh, some people say that um, the reason Nazism came about is because of the hyperinflation of Germany in 1923. Uh, I'm not sure that that's right, but that's certainly a hypothesis, and I think it's plausible. So inflation is a very dangerous sort of a thing, and who's in charge of inflation? Well, uh, central banking. And uh, what's the alternative to central banking? Well, the alternative to central banking is um, um, uh, free market money. And um, Milton Friedman is um, against this. Uh, you know, the way David says it is, well, he really doesn't like the Fed because uh, he uh, claims the Fed created the uh, Great Depression, which is true uh, in uh, Milton's um, um, big book with um, David. What's her name? Uh, his co-author, I forget. Uh, it, it's the Monetary History of the United States. Uh, yeah. What's his co-author? I forget her name. Uh, I'm blocking two. I'm sorry. Oh, good. Result, two, of us, uh, two, two of us are pathetic, David. <laughs> Uh, Schwartz, Anna Schwartz. Uh, Anna Schwartz, thanks. I, I want to give credit. Uh, and, and, and in that book, uh, Milton did say that. But uh, he also favored the 2% rule, and uh, or the 2 or 3% rule. And, you know, if you favor the 2 or 3% rule, you, you sort of uh, have to favor the, uh, the Fed a little bit. And uh, I think that uh, the Fed is a disaster. Uh, all government um, activity are, are problematic. And I think uh, the gold standard is free market money. And the sooner we get back to uh, the gold standard, or actually, you know, I'm not in favor of the gold standard. Uh, it could be platinum. It could be silver. Who knows? I, I favor free market money. We usually mention gold because uh, as sort of as a shorthand, because whenever people were free to choose, uh, they pretty much chose gold and uh, sometimes silver. But uh, we really don't favor the gold standard. We're not gold bugs. We're not like, um, uh, what's his name, Scrooge McDuck, where you sort of run gold through your fingers or through your 
flappers or whatever go, uh, whatever ducks have. So I, I think it's very important that we uh, go to a free market money as a protection against um, uh, government. Thank you. This is a case where Walter and I agree. That is to say, uh, the appropriate solution is not to reestablish the gold standard. The appropriate solution is to legalize private banks issuing money. But that is going to include fractional reserve private banks issuing money because that is, in fact, the observed market outcome. We've seen it in things like the Scottish system. Uh, so, uh, and I should say, I don't know where he gets this idea that my father is somehow against uh, that or against private money. Uh, my father, as I mentioned, has an article on the optimal behavior of the money supply, which is not his 2% rule. I once pointed out to him that in a simplified model of competing issuers, the equilibrium market result was precisely what his optimal rule was, and he agreed with me. Uh, so uh, it's you, you're sort of attacking uh, invented opponents. My father analyzed the behavior of the Fed because the Fed existed. Uh, our biggest difference, not disagreement, was that I was interested in the theoretical question of what you would get if you carried market principles all the way, and he was interested in the question, in the world as it is, how do you make things work better? Uh, and in the world as it is, the Fed exists, and so he was giving advice on what it should do. That's not an argument that you have to have the Fed, uh, and nor, as far as I know, can you find any place where he said you have to have the Fed. That's uh, your fantasy or maybe Rothbard's fantasy. All right, next question. All right. Um, so I'm going to, uh, this question is going to be for uh, Dr. Friedman. Um, and then after this question, we'll move on to uh, a question that is more um, kind of switching from attack to defense the uh, other way around. Um, uh, for, so Dr. Block, I mean, Dr. Uh, Dr. Block will be kind of attacking after this. So Dr. F Dr. Uh, Friedman, what is your, um, view on the Austrian business cycle? My non-expert view is that it is probably wrong because that was my father's opinion and he knew more about the subject than I did, but I don't work in macro. So I have not tried to include, and I should say, I don't think that man economy of state actually gets into that. At least I didn't see any discussion of the macro issues. So my guess is that it is wrong, but my father's view, at least as I understand it, was that it was not logically impossible, but that it didn't fit the data. Uh, and that in order to make it appear to fit the data, Rothbard had to do various weird things with uh, his definition of the money supply and such. But whether that's right, I really don't know. And I don't want to claim expertise in a field. I don't have it. All right. Would you like to um, clarify anything, Dr. Block? Yeah, I favor the Austrian business cycle theory. I think it's correct. Uh, the way it, it uh, thumbnail sketch of it. I'm no expert on this either. I uh, am with David on this. I'm both of us, I can speak for him, are more micro than macro. But uh, I uh, certainly do support this. What, what happens is they, uh, the government increases the money supply and lowers the rate of interest compared to what it otherwise would have been. And what this does is it makes all um, future uh, income, present discounted value of future income more valuable. However, it makes short-term uh, 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 one-year-away stuff uh, just a little bit more valuable, but it makes 20-year stuff way more valuable. If you lower the rate of interest from 4 to 3%, uh, the present discounted value of a dollar uh, in a year from now changes just a little bit. But the, the stuff in 20 years changes a lot. So people are led as if by Adam Smith's invisible hand to start producing more roundabout uh, projects that take 20 or 30 or 50 years and fewer that take one, two or three years. But this is unsustainable because the time preferences of the people haven't changed. Just the Fed has lowered the rate of interest. The rate of interest is a very important price. Uh, it permeates pretty much everything, uh, much more than oil or steel or anything else like that. Uh, so the idea here is that um, uh, it, it leads to a misallocation of investment and uh, the longer term investments are not sustainable because the savings hasn't increased in order to support such roundabout projects. And that, and eventually you have to get into a boom and uh, a rather a bust uh, because this is unsustainable stuff. So I am a, a big fan of, of the uh, Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, the, the David's argument against this uh, was done by Richard Wagner of um, um, 
George Mason. And what Wagner said is, well, eventually people should learn that these uh, long-term investments are unsustainable. Uh, so why don't they stop doing it? And, uh, and what Wagner and David uh, forget about, I think, is that not only does it uh, lead as if by an invisible hand to do this, but also subsidizes uh, people into doing this. And the idea is to do it and then to get out uh, right before. So uh, now if you're gonna assume perfect knowledge, well then um, you know all bets are off. But if you wanna be realistic about this, there's no such thing as perfect knowledge. And that's why we have this boom bust cycle because the government keeps messing around with the interest rate. Let right. me have the rest of my two minutes that I didn't use before, since now yes, that sir. Walter has described the theory, I would make essentially Wagner's objection, which is Go this supposed to have happened over and over again. And you would think if it's happened over and over again, that the entrepreneurs who are supposed to be making the economy work in the Austrian view would have noticed, and they would have said, all right, uh, we should assume there will be a low interest rate for a little while and make our investment plans on that assumption. But we know, because it's happened seven times before, we know that after a little while, we'll go back up again because they're not holding the interest rate down and therefore not make very long-term plans. So the assumption in this, and I think the assumption in almost all versions of macro that I've seen, uh, is uh, that people are consistently making the same mistakes over and over again, which is one of the reasons I don't do macro because I have not seen an intuitively plausible version of macro of any sort. I should say, I don't really like the terms price theory, ter terms micro and macro because micro suggests small and the proper terms I think are price theory and disequilibrium theory that the world wheat market is a problem in microeconomics. That is to say, it's a problem in price theory. But anyway, but that would be my objection. And I didn't know that Wagner had made it, but it's the objection that struck me a long time ago. Next question. All right. So this one's kind of just general for both of you. Um, and by the way, um, I know every question is different and some two, min two minutes is not a lot of time. So if you guys go over two minutes, I'll just allow that and make sure that you both get equal time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So how does your how would your school deal with uh, negative externalities? Uh, whoever who wants to start off, I think it's. Uh... Well, David ended so he can start and I'll end this one. Sure. Uh... I would say that both negative and positive externalities have the result that if the government does nothing, you will get a worse result than if you had a perfectly wise government uh, intervening in the situation. We are rather short of perfectly wise and benevolent governments. And therefore in practice, uh, the some negative externalities and can be taken care of through the tort system by suing people when they put uh, air pollution into the air over your house. Some of them are ignored. As long as we have a government, a legitimate solution, if the government makes the right decision, is to say we will have a what's called a Peguvian tax. That is to say we will have a, a, a tax in which you've got to pay for the external cost you're doing, which is sort of a substitute for the tort system being run by the government. Some externalities will be taken care of by the Kosian method, that is by bargaining between the parties. Uh, but I don't expect that you're going to ha ever have a world which is, which is optimal, that the optimal world is a useful benchmark because the optimal world is the world you would have if everybody always took the actions that maximized uh, total welfare. And the perfect competition is a nice model of a situation that gives you that, but it requires no externalities, no public goods, no monopolies, a bunch of other things. So you can use that as sort of a first approximation. And it's a useful approximation because it can be used to show people that it is possible to coordinate without central control, since that's what the market is doing. But that's all it is. And you are then faced with a bunch of imperfect solutions to those, to those sorts of problems. Uh, and it's true even of anarchy. I have a discussion in the third edition of Machinery of Freedom of market failure uh, on the market for law where I'm imagining law to be itself produced on the free market. And I'm showing what are the cases in which the law that comes out of the free market won't be optimal. Nonetheless, we have no better way of doing it. Thank you. Um, Logan, I think you should keep us to two minutes because I have to leave one of these days. And if we keep uh, going on I'm keeping and on. It, I'm keeping it to 30, 40 minutes. It's not gonna go over. I'm just saying, if you wanna okay. go a little bit over, you know, it's fine. Okay, okay. fine. Good. Now, I, I, I'm sure David will agree with me that, Logan, you've been a very good um, uh, moderator. See, David and I do agree on something. 
Uh, look, I, I went over positive externalities. Uh, the usual one is education. Uh, Milton Friedman favors the voucher system, which um, I find problematic because it's uh, part of government and um, uh, it's part of, uh, which is a libertarian issue. But the economic issue is um, that, that it's a market failure. I don't see any market failures. I don't see why we should take cognizance in the fact that uh, you know, if you go to school, you'll be a better voter and you'll be less of a criminal and, and therefore I should pay you for something uh, uh, out of my tax money. I, I think that that's just um, part and parcel of the um, Chicago um, market failure doctrine. And on uh, negative externalities, I don't think that they're externalities. I don't see any um, externality. I don't see any market failure. This is a, I won't say a Chicago monopoly because the Harvard people love um, uh, uh, market failures as well, but this is a, a rather a trespass. Look, if I take my garbage, eggshells, orange peels, uh, lemon rinds, whatever, and I dump it on your front lawn, we know what that is. That's trespass. And now what I do is I incinerate it first and I send it over to your, uh, your lawn and now all of a sudden it's an externality. No, it's just trespass. Uh, uh, David did mention torts, you sued. You know, the, the American um, dream is sue the bastards. Well, uh, you got to sue them. Uh, and yet the, the government uh, has made these things unactionable. Uh, so I, I, I reject uh, all market failures, monopoly, monopsony, um, externalities, public goods, the whole, the whole um, uh, lot of them. And I, uh, you know, the Chicago and the Austrian schools are supposed to be the both two free enterprise schools of, of, of thought. Well, the Austrian is a way more free enterprise than the Chicago one. Well, I don't, oh, sorry, I'm finished. Uh, you can, you can. Oh, I, like I just want to say, I don't yeah. think anyone in Chicago has said that the people who, oppo who oppose the draft uh, are the enemies of liberty, which is a quote from uh, Ludwig von Mises, who's generally seen as a leading figure in the Austrian. So I don't think it is consistently true that one group or another is more libertarian or more free market, that each of them is a set of people with uh, related ideas, and they have a wide range of political views. And Rothbard is an anarchist. Mises is not an anarchist. Mises is maybe even less an anarchist than my father was, since he was against the draft. Uh, but in any case, that was all I wanted to say. Well, I'll, I'll just chime in again. Uh, David says, cozy and bargaining. Uh, there's no such thing as cozy and bargaining. There's only cozy and bargaining in the zero transactions cost world. In the high transactions cost world, the, the government or the, the court has to be the central planner. So I think uh, David is misunderstanding uh, Ronald Coase. All right. Um, so. This is a question. It says, um, we're... "All right, so uh, whose turn is it to speak?" I'm sorry. I, it's questions. Oh. It depends who the question is to. I was trying to go back and forth, but uh, it doesn't matter because this is an equal question anyway. Okay, so the wealth of nations by Adam Smith. Do you guys have any critiques of it? Uh, you, this question's for David, so you can go first. Sure. Uh, do I have any critiques of it? Sure. Smith was not a very good theorist. Uh, Ricardo starts his book uh, by saying, any place I don't say I disagree with Smith, I agree with him, and then demonstrates in a simple and straightforward fashion that, that Smith's version of Christ theory was wrong. Uh, so he's not a very good theorist. He is a very interesting thinker who covers a wide range of things. He is widely accused by people, including Rothbard, of views he didn't hold. He did not, for example, support public education. He offered arguments both for and against it. And his final conclusion was that it would not be unjust to have some moderate subsidy to education, but it would also not be unjust and might be not more prudent to leave education entirely private. Uh, if people are curious, uh, you can find on my, if, if you search my blog, which is called Ideas, uh, you can find a fairly detailed discussion uh, of what Smith's views on various things were. But in the he was a very interesting guy. He was not an anarchist. Uh, he was an important figure in economics and he got some things right and some things wrong, just like most of us. Speak for yourself, David. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't get anything right at all, Walter? No, 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 I'm just being silly. I'm being silly, David. You, we both are imperfect creatures. Let me talk about Adam Smith. Um, Adam Smith's book is uh, like the little girl with the curl. When she was good, she was awfully good. When she was bad, she was horrid. 
Adam Smith was very, very good on, on The Invisible Hand. I mean, I, I uh, make great use of that with my freshman classes in economics. The Invisible Hand, I mean, that's just magnificent. I don't know if it was original. Murray's criticism of everything good in Adam Smith was not original and everything original was wrong. Uh, and there are other people that disagree. I'm not a real Adam Smith, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, scholar. So I, I, I don't know, but I suspect Murray was right because I think Murray is right on most things, virtually everything. Uh, the, wh where was the horrid part? The horrid part was the, the labor theory of value. He believed in the labor theory of value and he deduced improperly from it. Marx agreed also with the labor theory of value and deduced correctly, namely that you're stealing money from the, uh, the proletariat by the bourgeois. Uh, so Adam Smith um, favored the labor theory of value, which I think is highly problematic. On the other hand, you know, uh, the wealth of nations, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and the way it's interpreted nowadays is that the more economic freedom you have, uh, the better. One of the things I did when I was at the Fraser Institute is I started this thing um, uh, comparing the um, uh, economic freedom of all the countries in the world. And we found a, a much to everyone's amazement that the freer the country, uh, uh, the, the wealthier it was. Well, we sort of owe some of that to Adam Smith, the father of economics in the view of many people. Logan, you're up. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, all right, so I think um, we're gonna um, conclude the questions for now. We might ask some like fun, like off topic questions uh, while we're waiting for the results. Um, but I think we're gonna uh, go ahead and start the conclusions. Uh, who would like to go first? Or I who's, think we who's agreed. I think we yeah. agreed the water got the I, final. The final. No, no, yeah, David, you go now. Okay. Yes, right. Uh, my basic point I think I've made already, uh, and that is that the Austrian approach, at least Rothbard's version, drastically oversimplifies the world and therefore treats it as if economic theory was enough to answer questions uh, without actually looking at empirical facts. Uh, the, <clears throat> let me, oh, I should say, uh, one more response to Walter complaining that I was going into the wrong area. He spent quite a lot of time in his talk talking not economics, but philosophy. Uh, and I wanted to argue about economics, but that's all right. Uh, I just don't think it's as interesting. Uh, let me, I, I think I want to talk mostly about market failure because that's an issue that Walter has raised. And what market failure means is situations where individual rationality doesn't produce group rationality. That is situations where it, if each individual uh, acts rationally in his own interest, the result is worse for the group and in the extreme case, worse for all members of the group. And we've already seen one such example. And it's an example that Murray somehow manages to ignore, namely that he says that if the monopolists increase in prices making consumers worse off, then the consumers will all get together and agree to buy less in order that the monopolist will have to lower his price. And the reason that doesn't happen is a form of market failure called the public good problem. The fact that any individual among those, uh, uh, any individual among those uh, consumers who does that makes himself worse off in order to slightly benefit the rest of them by giving a slightly more incentive to, to, to cut prices to the, to the seller. But there are lots of other examples. Uh, and the basic logic in each of them let me go back a step. The fundamental problem we face is what economists call the coordination problem. With large numbers of different people with different abilities and different knowledge, how do we somehow coordinate their activities in such a way that things that are worth doing get done and things that aren't worth doing don't get done? And the elegant solution to that is if you can set up institutions so that each person bears the cost of his action and gets the benefits. And therefore his interest will be the same as the interest of everybody. The free market does that to a first approximation, and that approximation then breaks down when I take an action which imposes costs on you such that they can't be handled through the market. Uh, Walter thinks that the solution to air pollution is tort damages. That works just fine if I have one factory and you have one house being air polluted. If I have one factory and the air pollution is imposing a cost of a penny each on 10 million people, that's a very large cost, but we don't really have a decent way of using tort law to, to deal with it. 
Uh, similarly, if I'm doing something that produces a benefit, for example, giving this, uh, this debate, I am increasing the amount of true knowledge in the world, uh, decreasing the amount of false knowledge. This is a benefit, which is rather small, I admit, because I, I may not even succeed in persuading Walter, let alone all the rest of the world. But even a one cent benefit, since it's going to benefit 8 billion people by making it more likely we'll have a free society in the future, is worth a lot. And yet, for some reason, nobody's paying you for it. So market failure describes all of those situations. The problem, a major problem with handling market failures through government is that the big ones, the information is very unclear. And let me start with the one that I started with about uh, 40 or 50 years ago, and that's population growth. At the time when I got into the controversy, population growth played the same role in the public discourse that climate change does now. It was the looming catastrophe that all the intelligent people told us we had to do something drastic about. And so I wrote a piece in which I tried to estimate the externalities from increasing population by one. And I concluded that there were both positive externalities and negative externalities. And they were sufficiently uncertain that I couldn't sign the sum. I couldn't tell whether in fact the effect was a net benefit or a net cost in people. And that's a pretty strong argument against trying to do anything about it. I've gotten into that argument again for the last 15 years or so in the climate context, where the argument is that if we put, keep putting CO2 out, that that's a widely dispersed pollutant because it will raise temperatures. The problem is that we don't actually know whether increasing CO2 in the atmosphere is a good or bad thing. And I've got fairly long detailed discussions uh, of this uh, in which I, uh, I think show that there are large positive externalities, there are large negative externalities, you don't really know which, which, which ones are, are larger. So if people go to my blog ideas and search for climate change, they'll find information on that. Uh, but the general problem, as I say, is how do you set up your society so that on net, uh, things that are worth doing get done and things that aren't worth doing don't get done. In order for that to be a meaningful concept, you do have to have some way of comparing gains and losses to different people because things that you do affect different people differently. We have a way of doing it, not a very good way, but a way called economic efficiency. You can look in some of my books and see an explanation of what it is and what's wrong with it and why it's nonetheless the, the best we can do. Uh, so I guess that's, that's pretty much, uh, much the summary, that, that externalities uh, and public good problems are all cases where the, a per, what I refer to as a bureaucrat god, a perfectly wise, benevolent, all-powerful ruler, could make us better off. We don't have any of those. Furthermore, the same problems we call market failure apply to the political market. So that if you think about why voters are ignorant, voters are rationally ignorant. Each voter knows that the chance of his vote determining who is president is very, very close to zero, maybe as much as one in 10 million. It costs time and effort to figure out who ought to be president. It's not worth doing. So it makes much more sense to say, what political position can I hold that will make my friends like me and to vote accordingly uh, and not to worry about the real implications. That, that's rational behavior because there's a public good problem or if you like an externality uh, with regard to voting. That's the way the world is. Uh, and you can't make it disappear by, by waving your hands and pretending it isn't there. I think I've basically said what I have to say. I, I appreciate Walter having um, invited me to do this debate. It was a good opportunity. It gave me a chance to discover more things that his friend Murray Rothbard had wrong than I knew about before. Uh, as I already mentioned, I have a webbed summary of things wrong with that. Uh, and I also, have uh, wait somewhere I thought I had. I'll okay. post a link in the chat after the yes. debate if you just send right. it into the link. But if you, if you go to go to my webpage, which is davidfriedman.com, which is easy to find, and there are lots of other things that are relevant. Uh, in in and go to my blog. If you go to my blog and you look for for Murray Rothbard and Adam Smith, you can find the various ways in which I think Rothbard uh, badly misrepresented Smith. Uh, whether deliberately, it's not always hard to tell. It's all not always easy to tell. Uh, anyway, uh, I appreciated the opportunity to do this. Uh, I, I realized that Walter is not yet willing to admit that his position was wrong, but then my father was a very wise man. One of the pieces of advice he gave me is that the purpose of an argument is not to persuade somebody, it's to give somebody the arguments, the ideas with which he may later persuade himself.
and that is what I've been attempting to do. Thank you. All right, Dr. Block, would you like to, you have the floor. Would you it's like to honor. give your own closing statement? It's an honor and a privilege to debate David. I regard him as one of the brightest people on the planet and I'm delighted that he and I uh, got together. Uh, we know each other for many, many years. I guess when we were in our twenties, early twenties, we've been at it with each other and it's great that we did this in a formal way. I think David is wrong on, on his um, uh, point about these people that won't buy anything from unskilled workers. And then they'd say, David says, well, when the minimum wage comes along, they'll make more money and then people will buy from them. But then this is a rookie mistake. What, what David is, is actually saying is that the minimum wage raises anyone's wage. It doesn't raise anyone's wage. Uh, the minimum wage is not like a floor under wages and the higher it is, the higher wages. The minimum wage is like a barrier over which you have to jump and the higher the thing is, the harder it is to jump. So those people, um, uh, you know, didn't have an, any increase in their wage. So um, they would be unemployed in the first place. Let me talk just a little bit about fraction reserve banking. I, I, since David did it, I might as well do it as well. A, Mr. A deposits uh, $100 in Mr. B's bank. And uh, what does B give? A gives him a demand deposit, which means payable on demand. Not necessarily those gold coins, but payable on demand, uh, $100. And then B turns around the rascal and he lends 90 out to Mr. C. And what does he give to Mr. C? He gives Mr. C a demand deposit for 90. And now there's 190 where there used to be 100 and two people own the right to the same thing. Now look, David and I could be partners in a car. He uses the car Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I use the car Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Everything is fine. But to say that we both own 100% of the car, that's like a square circle. Now, if you want to call it fraud, fine. Don't call it fraud. But say that it's like a, an agreement to sell a square circle. You can't sell a square circle. There ain't no such thing as a square circle. You can't have two people owning 100% of the same thing. And that's what you get with fraction reserve banking. Now, um, he says that um, you can't have torts with air pollution. Well, look, you don't have a million um, uh, factories. You've got, I don't know, uh, 5,000 factories in, in the country, but we do have a million or 10 million or 50 million as cars. And each car uh, uh, pollutes, uh, you know, one millionth of 1%. And it's very difficult to sell, uh, to sue uh, David's car or uh, Logan's car or my car. What's Marty Rothbard's answer? Brilliant as always. You don't sue the car owner, you sue the road owner. And we're talking about private roads. And uh, how many private roads could there be? I don't know, 100 maybe? Uh, it's sort of like when a nightclub is loud and you, uh, you, uh, you don't like the noise, you don't sue each person in the nightclub, you sue the nightclub owner. So I think David is wrong on, on that one. Now about whether Milton Friedman um, uh, likes um, the Fed or not. You're not gonna find Ron Paul saying how, how best to run the Fed. Ron Paul would never in a million years do anything like that. Ron Paul would say, end the Fed, ban the Fed. When you start um, uh, trying to improve things, uh, uh, what you're implicitly saying is that you approve of the thing. Look, um, Milton Friedman did the same thing with the draft. One of my very first articles was on the draft and Milton Friedman favored the draft for two reasons. One, a legitimate reason, namely the draft is uh, semi-slavery, fine. But the other was to get the Vietnam War run more efficiently. But suppose you opposed the Vietnam War. Suppose you thought it was imperialistic and it was a violation of rights because uh, as Muhammad Ali said, none of them Viet Cong or Vietnamese ever called me the N-word. Uh, he didn't want to go there. You're not going to find Murray Rothbard saying uh, that we, uh, we should, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, make the thing more efficient. Look, uh, we oppose concentration camps. Concentration camps are evil. Do we want to make it more efficient or less efficient? less efficient. Now, if Milton Friedman really didn't like the Fed, he wouldn't be trying to make it run better. I mean, if you're trying to say that the thing should run better and here's how to run it better, um, what, what you're really doing is um, um, giving an imprimatur of it. Friedman gives an imprimatur of it and he gives the imprimatur of the uh, Vietnam War, the US side. And I think, uh, but that's a constant um, refrain with him. Something is evil and instead of opposing it, 
uh, he makes some sort of uh, quasi demi semi thing. The same with school vouchers. Why doesn't he come out in favor of uh, uh, private education? Why shouldn't education be just as free as? Uh, now look, I'm, I am now talking about libertarianism, but David started it, and David was um, uh, improper in doing that. And uh, and now he talks about uh, one last point on economics. He says, well, we should have cozy and bargaining. You can look. David doesn't understand Coase. Coase had uh, two states of the world. One was zero transaction and one was high or infinite transaction. And in the zero transaction cost, anyone can bargain with anyone. And then uh, Coase says, well, you know, uh, it doesn't matter uh, what the judge says, uh, you give it to whoever values it more. Uh, you got to increase welfare, not, not God forbid, uh, GDP. And in, the, and in the high transactions cost world, where bargaining is impossible, according to Coase, well, then you just give it to the one who values it more. Uh, whereas a libertarian would look at the, the past. Who is the owner of that shirt? I, I want that, David, I want that shirt. I value it more. Uh, let me just end by saying it was a pleasure debating you. And I hope that you thought it was valuable enough so that we could have part two and talk about libertarianism, not economics. And then, well, maybe we can, then maybe we can go more deeply into fractional reserve banking and other libertarian issues. Now, you might think that there wouldn't be much difference between David and me because we're both anarcho-capitalists, but I, I assure you there is. And I'm sure David would agree with me on that as well. Yes, indeed. You make lots of mistakes. I only make a few mistakes, I hope. All right, guys. Um, so is there anything else you want to say, Dr. Block? Well, that, that was it. Um, the debate is over, uh, yes. according to our agreement. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm going to open up the audience voting. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Thank you guys both for coming so much. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, this was, it got a bit heated at times, but it was, it was entertaining. <laughs> um, so, guys, the voting is going to be open. Uh, I'm going to ping you in the channel that it's opening at. And you guys can uh, put your votes in. Uh, we're about to see how many people stayed for the whole two hours. <laughs> Hopefully a decent amount. It looks like we have a, a pretty big audience still. Um, so I'm going to do that right now. So look out for the ping, guys. Uh, Dr. Blog, is there any links you want us to uh, send the audience? Any what? Links, because I'm going to be sending uh, a link to Dr. Friedman's website uh, to just, all the links that he mentioned. Just Google me, Walter Block. You, you could also send, if you like, a link, just a minute, I had a minute ago, to uh, I've been turning a whole lot, number of blogs into a future book maybe a couple of books, and I've been webbing the parts I've done so far. So I'm gonna put in chat the link for that, which I'm hoping to get comments on uh, in just a minute, uh, to everyone. Let, so let me just set that up that, as well as the link to my, to my blog, and that may let me, uh, let me just say that the, the preeminent uh, institution supporting Austrian economics, is the Mises Institute, M-I-S-E-S -E Institute in Auburn, Alabama. And if people are interested in uh, further um, perusing uh, Austrian economics, go to the Mises web. In particular, what the Mises people have done is to web to make freely available a whole lot of useful information. So I'm pretty sure that the copy of Man, Economy and State that I was tearing to bits uh, at, at following Walter's suggestion was theirs. Uh, furthermore, when I was writing some stuff about some of my arguments with Rothbard, uh, one of the nice people at Mises Institute pointed me at, at where I could find uh, what Rothbard had written in detail, which was in particular a particular argument we had, which I thought existed only in my memory, and it turned out it existed in something he had written, and I could therefore point people at it. So no, the Mises people, I think I probably disagree with them quite a lot, but they are very useful in the making information available online.
Yes, it's a great institute. I can vouch. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to give them a couple minutes. Um, uh, do you guys, are you guys okay if I put this on YouTube? Sure. All right. A lot of people were like, I, I can't come, but I really, really want to see this. Mm -hmm. So they'll be happy to see that. Um, we cut the audience questions a bit short because we're really uh, starting to run short on time. Uh, but I think a lot was said. I think this was a pretty successful debate. I'd love to have you guys back. If that's something you guys are interested in. Uh, I think I, I think a lot of people would like to see a, a debate on libertarian principles as well. Um, but I, I think this was a really fun economics debate. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of mixed results in the, in the polls, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen when I end the polls. <laughs> um, in behalf of me and David, do send us both the URL for this. Sure. Okay, yeah. Logan? I, I want to yes, put it on my web page. See, David and I'll I send you guys. Of, David and I agree on a lot of things. <laughs> I'll send you guys the raw file, and I'll send you guys the video as well. Yeah, yeah. now if we do something on libertarianism, there are, in a sense, two different questions that can get confused, one of which is the best way of persuading people of libertarianism, and the other is what are correct libertarian doctrines, so to speak. The, but I suspect that part of the difference will turn out to be the same difference, that from my standpoint, Walter has much too simple a picture of the world, and that there are actually a whole lot of hard questions in the, in the world to which there aren't always tidy answers. All right, guys. I'm going to give you guys like 30 more seconds. I'm going to close it. Um, I'm going to, well, I'm going to uh, do one more ping. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll close it. And then I'll announce the data. If it's not unanimous, I'm not going to declare a winner. I'll just read out the data uh, unless it's like really obvious. Okay. Um, it's only unanimous if Walter and I both agree, which is not likely to happen. <laughs> that's true. So I'll just, I'll just read the data. If it's unanimous, you know, Bye. Everyone will know except for the people that you know don't think it's unanimous. Uh, we'll see. We want the before and after, basically. Yeah, this is Soho style. So they weren't asked who won the debate. They were just asked, what was your opinion before? What was your opinion after? That's right. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Let's see. Uh, all right. I'm closing it now. David, we do look at empirical facts. It's just that we don't think that they test the theory, but we're not oblivious to empirical facts. What use are they if your theory tells you the right answer? Yes, certain theories tell us the right answer, but we still look at empirical facts. Why? Why do you care? Oh, we're, we're very interested in reality but to see how well it matches up. But and when since you already know that it's going to be true, I don't understand why you have to bother. Just to see if uh, reality behaves. <laughs> right. Yes, clearly there's a, a little bit of a reverse in reproaches here. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start off with the neutral. So uh, the votes, we had one Austrian, one Chicago, and four undecided. So that was completely useless. Uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking this one was going to just, so I, I separated, I should announce, I separated the voting into how they, how they voted before. So, so you're I saying of the people who were initially neutral, so the one people of them who, went with me, one of them went with Walter, and one of them is, is, still, is still neutral. Yeah, four of them are still neutral. So that was a complete wash. I was thinking that was going to decide it, but I'll start there since that one uh, wasn't that interesting. Yes. So. <laughs> no, no, no. That was interesting. It means it's a tie. But there I want to know what's happened with my target-rich environment. Yeah, well, I understand. But so far, it's a tie. So, so far, it's a tie. Right. Not, not uninteresting. You know, uh -huh. a tie is interesting. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, so in the Chicago, it was zero votes altogether. I guess the four people didn't stick around. Um, actually, I know they did stick around. I don't think they voted. I did see one of them in here. Uh, I know there was a huge David Friedman fan on our staff team. Um, 
So we have the Austrian school, which is, is going to be the determining factor. Um, or, you know, it's not going to be unanimous because it can't be. But you get what my point is. So we had 10 people vote Austrian. We had two switch to the sh- Chicago and one switch to undecided. Obviously, a lot of the people here were Austrian, most of them because they're libertarians. It's kind of a unanimous thing. I don't think it's that uncommon uh, for them to switch. But I, I think you guys both put up a good performance regardless. Um, <laughs> I, th- I think it was very, very entertaining. Uh, a-, a lot of people seem to have fun, judging by the chat. So uh, we had a lot of participation here. We had probably about 100 people, I would say. I mean, we had two full chats of 50. So that's that's pretty uh, incredible. Um, this is a pretty big event. I, I think this is probably one of the biggest events ever on a libertarian server. I, I know, Walter Block, you're doing one in uh, January uh, with the Austrian server. Is that right? I don't remember. I, I've got it written on my account. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, the, the, the Austrian server's got one coming up in January. That's probably going to top it. But this is a pretty big one. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much. If you guys want to come back for another one, I'm absolutely, I would love to have you guys. Um, so, you know, we could communicate over email about that. Uh, but thank you guys both for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, Logan. Bye. Take care, Thank guys. you. Take care, David. Uh-huh.